welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College's Open Campus and part of our speaker series. I'm Carol Miner, the provost of Open Campus and your host today. My special guest is Hazel Henderson, who is definitely worth quoting. She's an author, a futurist, an economist, and someone who's really making a difference in the world. Hazel, we're really glad to have you. Thank you, Carol. It's Good. great to be here. It's great to have you. I know that your theme for life that you're spreading around the world is think globally and act locally. Can you give me a little bit more meat on that? Well, I think if we are going to deal with all of the problems of the future of Florida, and North Florida, and the Jacksonville area, we are going to have to put ourselves in this new global context, you know, this global trading fast lane and the global casino, you know, where all the stock markets never close and all of that. And uh, we need to be able to understand all of these enormous forces for change, which are really restructuring the world that we live in. And I think if we don't do that, uh, it's very difficult to deal with the local issues. Well, it sounds like the old ways of thinking about the world and the old ways of thinking about economic development, for example, don't fit anymore. No, and it's the same everywhere in the world that you go, and it's really like the world has, has reached a new stage now, and for 200 years the world has been on this whole idea of industrialization. And suddenly uh, we've realized that uh, the new stage that we've reached, of course, is a post-industrial stage, and I'm sure you've heard that phrase, and lots of books have been written about that, and what is this post-industrial uh, phase uh, really? about is it the information society uh, I call it the solar age and the reason I use that name for this new era that we're moving into is that we really have to figure out now whether we're east or west north or south uh, how to make uh, economic development compatible with the environment that's one thing I didn't say in your introduction is that your, your roots are in the environmental movement Yes. And that yes. your need f to understand economics was based on some arguments, I guess, that say that we can't do this because it doesn't make economic sense. Yes. I, I remember in the 60s when I helped to start a group called Citizens for Clean Air and sort of organized the mothers in the play park, you know, which is about where I was then with a little girl and worrying about the air she was breathing. And every time I tried to raise a complaint, uh, some economist for the power company or whatever company it was or the Chamber of Commerce w would say, oh no, you know, what you're proposing to do isn't economically feasible. And I thought, well, I had better find out what's wrong with economics. You know, it, it never occurred to me that I was denying my own senses. I knew the air was polluted, and I knew the water was getting dirtier. I knew that human beings need a clean environment to live. So therefore, I knew there must be something wrong with economic theory. And uh, it turned out um, that that was absolutely true, that it doesn't matter what economists that you go to from left to right, communism to capitalism, we're beginning to realize now that basically both Karl Marx and Adam Smith uh, both agreed about the basic agenda. They both thought it was a wonderful idea to industrialize the planet. And today, of course, the real problem is, and, and I just came back from Moscow and talking about this in the Soviet Union, is that the poor planet Earth can't deal with much more of this kind of industrialization. So this is the new stage, and this means that most economic theory is going to have to be very drastically overhauled. Do you think, I mean, I don't think most people in Jacksonville think that other people, people in Russia, for example, are having the same sort of conversations and concerns? Well, it is amazing over there. I mean, I have, uh, I brought back a copy of a magazine, and as I was reading it on the plane, it was the most muckraking environmental magazine that uh, I have ever seen, you know, put Greenpeace to shame. <laughs> That's and uh, they have about 80 active environmental organizations now, and in many ways it's driving a lot of this desire to break away, you know, this nationalistic movement, because they're saying, we don't want all of these old industries run from Moscow polluting our rivers and uh, polluting our air. And so, um, <laughs> as I say, it's, it's no longer a matter, a matter of whether it's communism or capitalism. Both of those two systems still pollute the environment and 
the whole conversation now, wherever one goes in the world, is about how to rethink what we mean by economic development and sort of how to sort out the difference between money and true wealth. And, and somewhere during the Industrial Revolution, we sort of got off track with that. And we got these sort of money scoring cards, like the gross national product. And if the gross national product was going to go up, then everything was going to be OK. And we never noticed that um, there were a whole lot of social costs and a whole lot of environmental costs. So it was never it. accurate. It's not like things have changed. It's just that we were never factoring in some of these costs that you're talking yes, about. Yes, th that's right. Uh, we were sweeping them all under the rug. And then if you remember, in the 1970s, there was a big debate going on around the country that we were uh, so-called uh, losing our productivity. And American productivity was declining. And I remember testifying be before the Joint Economic Committee back in those days and saying, well, uh, I you know, uh, surprise, surprise. I mean, it was because we've been overstating productivity for decades with this very narrow measure and sweeping all of these enormous public problems that it was creating under the rug. And all that's happening now is that um, the, the bills are coming due. You know, suddenly we have to pay 30 billion to keep clean water coming out of the faucets. And we've got to pay 100 billion to clean up, you know, um, one of these nuclear energy plants in Ohio. and big bills. We've been doing that here in Jacksonville too where we've taken it taken for granted the quality of life that we have, our green space, our water and our air. And I think that people are now um, really realizing that those have long-term costs, health costs yes, for one. Absolutely. And you see in economic theory both both capitalist economic theory and communist and socialist economic theory, air and water are, are free. So as long as you don't value these things, and they're not entered into the accounting system. And so, you know, we're at a situation now where there just isn't that much more clean air and clean water to pollute. And the real problem is that that uh, drives your industrial development in an unsustainable direction, because sooner or later you run out of clean air and clean water, and you start getting these health costs. And then you have to make a very, very costly overhaul, whereas if that had been factored into the price of the product all the way through the whole process, there would be a whole lot of unsustainable products that wouldn't be on the market, you know, like um, aerosol cans driven by CFC propellants, for example, which if you factored in all of the costs of that aerosol can to the ozone layer and everything else, I mean, you're probably talking about $12,000 a can. And after all, consumers don't mind at all switching to a little pump spray does all the same things. Um, but we didn't know. We didn't know the full price. How come we didn't know? I mean, uh, people knew when they didn't factor it in, or this is new information? A lot of it is longer term information. You see, in our whole decision making system set on this very short economic time frames where you, know, you have to tell the shareholders that you made a profit in this quarter and you have to tell them, you know, in the annual report that you know your profits. So the whole system is very much on a short term time scale. And we've realized now that we've trained a whole generation of business school students at the Harvard Business School and places like that with these very short-term time horizons. And unfortunately, today, as we move into this era of global interdependence that, uh, that I've been describing, uh, we find that you have to look at the longer term because, you know, prevention is always a hundred times cheaper than having to follow up and try to patch things up after the fact. Our, I mean, this sounds so big, the systems change that you're talking about. Um, is it being approached, like in Europe, 1990, the 1992 group? Is it, are you able to help other, uh, other countries approach it another way? How, how are we mm -hmm. ever going to get there? Well, uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of countries, whole countries, are now beginning to say, hey, we have got to get on to a better scorecard than this gross national product thing. Because uh, like, for example, a lot of countries uh, in Latin America, if they have to meet uh, GNP growth rate projections, it means they're going to have to burn down more and more acres of rainforest to pay their debts and all 
of this kind of thing. And so I have been working with the people in Venezuela who are saying, good heavens, you know, we don't want to be pulled into this kind of a system. And if we're counting the rainforests at zero in the accounts, they're not carried on the books as an asset, even though they're most priceless asset probably that the country has. How will we ever get this kind of thing factored in until it's all gone? And so uh, every place I go, um, there is the realization now that we need to shift this accounting system around uh, to reflect these, these longer term uh, costs. And you know, I was very surprised, Carol, to find that um, thanks to you, I discovered what Jacksonville has been doing here with this quality of life indicators that you developed. And uh, um, I, this may be news to the citizens of Jacksonville, but um, Jacksonville is being held up as an example, and uh, people are learning about the quality of life indicators here. Um, in places like Moscow and uh, Caracas and Tokyo. <laughs> so so you could, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about how those quality of life indicators were developed because to me, you see, they are part of the future quality of life scorecard, which eventually is going to make uh, cities and regions more competitive. I think you're right. I think part of it is a grassroots process that uh, Jacksonville Community Council, which is a community planning agency, worked with. And through a lot of discussion about what makes sense um, and whether or not, and some agreement on whether or not those indicators, um, when they went up, it was good or bad. You could tell, you know, that, that they really meant something. For example, if you had fewer bad quality air days, that was bad. And if you had, if you had so more quality, if you had, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, your, if your quality of air days the good good days went up, then everybody agreed that that was a good indicator. That was good, yeah. Right. Mm. And if they went down, we all agreed that that was a negative sign. Yeah. And so there had to be the agreement on what was going to be measured, what could be measured, that's very tough, mm -hmm. and then uh, what things were significant. So I think that process, which was really a grassroots effort, um, was very, very positive. And the process has continued where they've updated them on a yearly basis. And the Chamber of Commerce is to be commended for funding that study. That is, Isn't that amazing? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really, they, they are to be congratulated mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's about state of the art, you know, in terms of a, of a local, regional approach to social and uh, new economic indicators. It's the best thing well, that I've seen. That's right. And what's interesting is when the indicators go down or go negative, mm -hmm. then people are really concerned about that because we think it's going to hurt our economic growth. And I'm wondering if the GNP number, if we change from that system to another, what will the vested interest say? What will the what will the United States look like? Will we look better or worse on a new scale, on a new scorecard? Well, th this is the whole issue, you see, on this new scorecard where you take into account all of these other factors like literacy levels, like um, results, basically, are people healthier? It doesn't matter if you spend 12% of your GNP on health care if you don't have any healthier citizens than in a country that only spends one-third of that. Obviously, you want to look at results, and that's why you can't just have indicators of how much money you're throwing at problems. And so you need to go to indicators like how you know what's your literacy level uh, what's your infant mortality rate you know all of these kind of where the rubber actually hits the road and um, by those kind of scorecards you know uh, we have some distance to go in the United States. I mean, our um, infant mortality rate is way down below that of a lot of other uh, industrial countries. And by this new kind of scorecard where you're looking at air and water quality, at um, biodiversity in, in terms of how many species you have uh, in an area and all of that, uh, how your criminal justice system works. All of these are just as important for quality of life as whether your per capita income uh, is growing. So by these kind of scales, a country like Costa Rica, um, it sort of goes to the top of the class. And um, there are other countries, like, for example, Japan, where on a pure per capita income level, they look great. 
you know, they have all of this money, they're awash in, in green pieces of paper, and yet um, we all know that if you go to Tokyo or any other place in Japan, their quality of life is not as good as we have here in the United States. That's true. I think um, what's interesting is that the GNP, which is, I guess, a quantitative, not a qualitative, and it's Absolutely. very hard to to look at that and to decide. I mean, when you look at test scores in education, for example, and you and you compare rising test scores, that gives you some sort of a general feel. But there's more to it than that. It takes more thinking through it than that. Much more. And it can't all be in one simple set of money uh, indicators. And this is really the, the, the jump that has to be made because I think that if we had had um, a set of these sort of expanded indicators coming across the 630 News every night for the past 10 years, uh, we wouldn't have fallen into an education crisis. We wouldn't have fallen into a drug crisis or a homelessness crisis or a health care crisis or whatever because we would have been watching these indicators and they wouldn't have gotten so far out of hand. But what happened, as you know, was that we all sat in front of our TV sets all through the 1980s and we were told that the GNP was going up. Great! Hooray! Hooray! Everything is fine. And so we did not have our eye on all all of the things that we should have had our eyes on. That does explain a lot because I think people look at that number and they think it's supposed to indicate something and yet they're confused because we aren't doing as well in the, in the world scene. Yes, and uh, this uh, uh, is part of the shock, you know, when all of these books started coming out a few years ago, uh, talking about the relative decline of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And even then, it's only a relative decline. And in some sense, you know, uh, it's good news because uh, it was a pretty unsustainable situation for us to try to be the policeman to the world and the only powerful economy in the world and stuff like that. But um, in a sense, this kind of reappraisal where we're suddenly realizing, well, my gosh, if we'd had an indicator all of these years that had told us a very simple thing, like, for instance, that we use two and a half times as much energy in this country to produce the same unit of GNP, uh, as the Japanese or the, our competitors in Europe, in Western Europe. How do we expect to be competitive in a world economy if we're so wasteful? Or here we have this enormous amount of solid waste that we generate in this country, and we throw it into landfills, and we try to you know, get these expensive incinerators, and that creates air pollution, all costing millions and millions and millions of dollars. And whereas if we recycle more of it, like uh, the Japanese recycle 50% of all of their waste stream and plug it right back into the production process. So who's going to win at the global competitive stakes? So um, in a sense, we're really down to the wire now in terms of seeing how this is actually affecting our economy. Well, you mentioned um, in, in some of your writings about Florida and the plantation mentality that we have here and what that means and how we can, I mean, we're, we're basically selling ourselves very, very short. Can you, can yes, you well, amplify th this a little is, bit on that? Um, yeah, th this is uh, very much the conventional wisdom of economic thinking in most states that I go to, not, not only Florida. And I call it the plantation model because what it really says is, here we are, come and get us, you know, uh, put the state on the auction block to the highest bidder. And we have cheap land, cheap labor, um, low uh, taxes, few environmental regulations, uh, right to work. Uh, so come and get us. And it's such a disempowered type of model of economic development where the whole idea seems to be to look for some Korean assembly plant uh, to ride over the hill on a white horse and save us. Whereas the fallacy in that kind of thinking, which was very much propagated in the 70s, you know, by these accounting firms, um, who would say, if you don't have these conditions, you won't have a good business climate and try to scare all of these states. And instead, we find that the real situation is that there are 25,000 glossy brochures put out by local communities trying to, quote, lure 
that Korean assembly plant. And there's only 500 such location decisions made every year. So you've got those 25,000 brochures all competing for 500 plant location decisions. Mm. And the evidence that's coming in now shows that really the best way for econ to do economic development is to build a homegrown economy by really fertilizing your own grassroots entrepreneurs and find and of course investing in keeping your quality of life such that um, you don't incur these tremendous social costs. Well what's interesting is of course Jacksonville has been one of the 25,000 brochures and we've done very well because we've gotten major industry to move here primarily clean industry but their number one question is what's the educational system like? And what is the culture like? It goes beyond yes. how cheap is it going to be to work here. Exactly. And, and so what is happening now that there are a few of these kind of economic development firms now that are propagating slightly more sensible uh, advice and they have their own kind of quality of life indicators, as you know, where they're talking now about livability indexes. And uh, so this is definitely the direction things are going in the future. And Jacksonville is just looking into and just beginning beginning its recycling efforts. And so I think we have a long way to go yes. in that effort. Yes. But besides the local effort of, of sorting your garbage, I know that you're interested in some socially responsible investing as well. Well, yes, this whole area is where you look through the other end of the telescope and you realize that almost any useful social activity that a society uh, gets into, not just pure production of steel and pig iron, and that's what the GNP is about, you know, how much raw production do you do, but any kind of a services economy, an information economy, all can create jobs and can create a healthy economy. So my feeling is that the real leapfrog strategy for the 21st century is to take all of these environmental issues and use them creatively to develop the kind of green technologies, you know, the environmentally compatible technologies and those kind of companies. And I've been telling people in the state of Florida in Tallahassee that uh, we have a terrific opportunity, for example, to get into the desert greening business. I mean, desert greening is going to be a very big business in the 21st century. And we have all of the right uh, biotechnology people at the University of Florida who know how to hybridize the, the new plants which can make deserts bloom again. Uh, and it means really expanding your frame of reference so that you can see a lot more of these options. And that's the reason for expanding the analysis beyond that very narrow economic view because then you can see that there's lots more plays in the game. And for example, um, the whole area of socially responsible investing uh, which I began to be involved in in 1982 uh, when we founded the Calvert Social Investment Fund. And our fund only invests in companies that don't manufacture weapons, don't pollute the environment, and um, are not unfair to workers and all of these other kind of social screens. And lo and behold, we find that really this is where the future earnings are going to be. We had to pick and choose and we found that most of the big old Fortune 500 companies that were still polluting didn't fit um, in our criteria. But we had to beat the bushes for these little companies uh, like the ones who are recycling plastics and the ones who are going into the business of de-inking old newsprint. And and all kinds of wonderful little companies that have afforded our portfolio a tremendous amount of growth. And um, we've done very well. And this whole area now is a new niche in the investing marketplace that's gone from $40 billion of uh, investments in 1982 uh, to about $500 billion today. And we've just brought out a new set of principles now, which we call the Valdez principles. And that we're asking companies to sign on to this environmental set of principles because we don't we know that a company that has a Valdez in its future is not going to be a good investment. 
Does that mean no oil companies and no energy companies? Or? Um, not particularly, but it does mean that, uh, uh, for example, when you look at what happened in Bhopal, India, you see anyone who was holding that stock at the time uh, was in for a terrible shock. So it's a matter really of growing a whole new environmentally sustainable economy. And luckily there are hundreds of new startups with new technology, solar energy, renewable resource technologies that are going to provide the growth in the 21st century. We don't have much time, but I'm just wondering if we can even get more specific about local. And if you have any suggestions from your world travels and all your discussions about what a local government or local individuals or civic groups can do. Well, I think that every consumer uh, can uh, be a sensible shopper. And I like to uh, promote a, a little book that an organization uh, that I'm involved in uh, produced last year called Shopping for a Better World. And this is a little book that you can take into the supermarket with you. And you can find out for almost any product on the supermarket shelves, from mayonnaise to toothpaste to toilet paper, you can look up in this little book and find out which company produces these products and whether they have a good environmental citizen check mark. And so this way, every consumer can reward the companies that are the good guys. And also, you can do the same with your investments. And I'm sure if anybody calls up any broker here in Jacksonville and asks to see some of the um, material on these socially responsible funds, then they can put their money where their environmental consciousness is, as well, of course, as voting for the candidates uh, who really see this um, future where we really do have to shift the whole rule, all the rules of the game. That's wonderful. I think those are good suggestions. Plus, I guess participating in recycling and getting oh, more educated yes. and those kinds of things. Absolutely, yes. I mean, uh, I think that there again, we need many more local ordinances. And I believe there is an ordinance coming out of Tallahassee right. uh, well, on well, recycling. That's wonderful. Well, we are really happy to have had you, Hazel, and look forward to um, seeing some of your other programs that will also be on this station as we look at creating alternative futures which you produced. Oh, so you. we'll be able to spread the word that way. But in the meantime, this has been very, very interesting and I, I hope you all have enjoyed it as well. This is Carol Miner from Florida Community College with Hazel Henderson, environmentalist, futurist, and an economist. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>